Hello, we would like to welcome you to our webinar. This is the second installment in our USA Drone Conference webinar series, and it's the first of a two-part webinar series. The second part will air on June 1st at 4 p.m., so please be sure to sign up for that one if you found the content in this one valuable. The pre-recorded interview with the presenters for this webinar ran over our allotted time, so we will email you a link to access the extra discussion content at the conclusion of this webinar. You will also be able to rewatch this webinar afterward through the access link you have been provided for a week before we post the webinar onto our YouTube channel for everyone else to watch. Please post any questions you'd like to the presenters to answer after the pre-recorded session finishes and to the Q&A panel on the right side of the screen. We also want to thank our sponsors. Without them, we'd be unable to have our conference and webinar series. We especially want to thank our premier sponsor, Honeycomb Secure Systems. They are an elite digital security firm that provides assured, secure information and communication technology solutions within the life cycle of products and systems, ranging from research and development, system design, fabrication, integration, assurance validation and verification, to delivery, operations, and ultimately disposal. If your business would like to sponsor future webinars or topics of interest to you, please contact us. Well, I want to welcome everybody uh, to the USA uh, Drone Conference Series. Uh, this is our second edition, Spying on America by Foreign Made Drones. We have a great group of people here with us and I'm thankful to have you all here. I'm going to start from uh, my top left and go around. But, uh, yourself, please. And this is Tom Goldberg. I am a member of the Board of Directors of Honeycomb Secure Systems Incorporated. Uh, if there is any claim to fame that I have in this life, I'm the author of the statutory language on supply chain security for information technologies that DOD and the intelligence community must comply with. Uh, that wrote it in 2008 and it was first enacted in 2011 and I've got my fingerprints on some or all of the amendments that have been enacted uh, since that time. All right, uh, Mr. John Perry, would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is John Perry. Uh, I've been working in the uh, drone industry since uh, about uh, 2010 and uh, started one of the founders and, and led uh, a company called Altavian uh, for a long time, became a, a supplier to the uh, U.S. Army uh, for drone technology. And uh, these days I work as chairman and, uh, and uh, moving on to some uh, new um, startups. Great to have you here. Uh, Mr. Patrick Egan, would you introduce yourself, sir? Do I even need an introduction? No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, let's see. I've been uh, doing the uh, commercial drone thing for almost 20 years. Um, also been working on uh, airspace integration. I was on the FAA small UAS arc, uh, which was a um, that was an interesting uh, experience, but uh, you know, advocating for uh, small business jobs and STEM education is my thing, and uh, I'm glad to be here today to to talk about some of these issues, um, current issues at hand. Glad to have you here, Mr. Joel Coulter. It's Joel Coulter, president of Mobile Sciences Consortium. I've a serial entrepreneur. I've grown three drone companies. Started back in 2005, uh, mostly work with the Department of Defense, but I did a lot of work trans transitioning advanced defense drone technologies into civilian applications. Good to have you here. Um, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Chris Stiles, currently the Operations Director at the USA Drone Port. I've started with the drone industry in 2004. I was in the Army, started military intelligence before it was the aviation branch. Did that five years. Uh, spent several years overseas, uh, operations for deployed, got out of the army, did that as a contractor, started up companies, uh, written a lot of books, published papers, technical uh, publications and, and things in this nature in the field. Been a big uh, support and proponent for good legislation and pushing for the advancement of the technology uh, ever since I got out of the army. All right. Bart, uh, my name's Bart Massey. I'm the executive director of the USA Drone Port. All right, with that, Chris, uh, you want to you start with the first question, please? Sure. 
So this question is going to be for Mr. Tom Goldberg, if you could answer first, and then Coulter, uh, if you can follow that up. Why is securing drone systems, components, and data key to addressing spying? And why, from your perspective, is this the primary threat to the U.S. national security infrastructures? Well, to make a long story short, we've been doing this kind of security uh, analyses for some time. After 9-11, we took down all of the public information about critical uh, industrial sites from around the United States that we feared would be the target of terrorists. What we've done with drones today is simply repopulate that information and make it generally available any, to anyone around the world, and most particularly to China. So if we're going to be true to the rules that govern uh, things like toxic release inventories, which were established as EPA rules, but then taken down after 9-11 because we realized it gave the location of every uh, vessel containing uh, hazardous chemicals. Uh, we have to do the same when it comes to drones. We simply do not need adversaries to have a data-rich inventory of places that if they chose to attack, they could attack with impunity. Joel? All right. Well, I, I champion Tom's work in this area. I've been working on this for a while. It's The drones have so many applications within our national security infrastructure, whether it's our military, our energy, our logistics, our water. And we've the ability for the hacking of those components could allow anybody who's you know using the drone for official business to someone taking that drone and, and sending it off into a dangerous and use it for uh, a terrorist activity uh, in the data side of things it's it's really important because you know right now again not just China but a lot of people can surveil everything about our critical infrastructure and it's a great planning tool of how to uh, conduct a threat or an attack that, you know, you would never see coming. So uh, as drones move into logistics at high speed, uh, I always tell people that logistics, it's all about logistics. And if you can cut off uh, logistics uh, during a disaster, uh, that leads to the loss of life and other kinds of uh, dangerous things. Thank you, Joel. Uh, this question is for uh, Patrick and Chris. Um, from your all's perspective, uh, what are the factors that led to the U.S. Uh, being a global uh, leader in unmanned systems to, in 2005, uh, China having a global leadership position? Let's start with Patrick. Uh, it's simple. <clears throat> um, you know, in my estimation, uh, the single largest let's say, factor for the destruction of the U.S. Uh, hardware market. And uh, where we're seeing that trickle through uh, general aviation is the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. The prior, you know, I mean, the, the, most of the people in the history uh, of the drone thing have, they really have no idea. They think this thing just showed up maybe a couple of years ago. You go to Best Buy, you buy a drone. We had an ecosystem here. We had a very robust ecosystem here. FAA came in into February 2007 and arbitrarily banned commercial drones. And you guys probably, uh, a lot of the uh, old timers here probably remember that. Uh, I told uh, then leader uh, Earl Lawrence at uh, the UASIO at FAA that basically there's no way you can have a 10 year prohibition on a technology and think that you are going to uh, let's say, remain in the lead. And, uh, you know, I'm not even factoring in Moore's law on that. You know, that's just a solid 10-year shutdown. And who's going to pay the price for that? Who's going to pay the price for that? We're paying for the price uh, for that in technology. We're paying the price for that in uh, manufacturing. And we're also uh, have made ourselves, uh, basically developed a nice national security issue. Chris? I'd like to add on to Patrick's answer. I think even even the military defense side had, in my opinion, had a part to play in this because of the military's mission. You know, they just really started ramping up drone acquisition in the early 2000s, 2005 to nine. You know, you saw rapid acquisition of 
all kinds of sizes, but especially in the smaller ones. But the mission set that the, that the military uses wasn't really focused on how the commercial and, and private side of it utilizing drones. So typically a lot of technologies get a lot of money and, and, and research R&D from the military side that goes into the technology that eventually trickles into a commercial space. But well, we didn't have that. We had that huge gap. On top of with the FAA, you know, with, with Patrick, what he said, you had that 10 year pretty much lockdown on it. And even in 2013, whenever Congress came out with the FAA Reauthorization Act, the initial one that you know, ended this, the FAA was slow. They're, 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 they're an aircraft carrier. They're slow to pivot and turn. So they were full of a lot of manned aviators and that mindset. So it took them a while to get into the unmanned aspect of it. And they began with the approach of regulating for public agencies. They, they weren't even really looking at the commercial space and hobbyists. So they started rolling out policy and, and directives that was focused on that. And they didn't expect the commercial space to blow up like it has, you know, and then once it started to really pick up, they had to retool that and put a lot of their efforts into uh, regulating and coming out with policy that would support the, the, the commercial side. And that's been slow going, but, and the FA has been slow behind every marker that they've been mandated by Congress to have certain things established. We, they, the 107, that was supposed to happen much earlier than August of 2016. Remote ID was supposed to have happened, you know, already by now. Uh, look at the hobbyists. It took them over a year just to get their registration system set up for hobbyists and some of that stuff set up. So every benchmark has been slow for the FAA. And it's just something that would continue to pile on that we're, we're dealing with here. And it doesn't help from a security aspect because China was able to come in and take advantage of this situation. They had money, they could invest into the industry, uh, into their manufacturers. And so they, they were able to fill that void. So we've had a lot of acquisition from cheaper Chinese drone components that companies aren't necessarily focusing on what's a, a cyber or data privacy aspect of having these systems now. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's also, you know, we had like the double and triple whammy of um, ITAR. Uh, you know, a lot of companies, even La, I want to say, you know, what kind of kicked off the whole DIY thing was uh, FMA Direct, which was Fred Mark's uh, company. And, uh, you know, they were selling thermopiles and the government was, uh, you know, busting their chops about ITAR. These are, these are uh, relatively simple systems or products, but the Chinese, they don't have to deal with that. Um, we have to deal with it. The one other thing I want to touch on, you know, is everybody's like, well, how can you beat up on the FAA on this? Chris hit on something, you know, the, the main deadline they missed was there was supposed to be NASA integration in September of 2015 for UAS. Yeah. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, that was supposed to happen. FAA rolled back and said, well, ATO is not going to be ready. Have a nice day. No data, no report, no science, nothing. Just no accountability. Meeting. So you have to realize in this situation, what you have is an administrative lawmaking body. And uh, there, you can't fire these people. You can't get rid of them. There's no incentive for them to do anything. The other thing I'm going to say um, with that is the United States government, the federal government, totally, underestimated um, drones and commercial drones and what would be the, the mood at the unofficial mood at the FAA was uh, just put a lid on this drone thing. It's going to go away. 2008 or nine, I was in a meeting at NASA here at uh, NASA Ames. You had uh, representatives from top level of NASA, NOAA, FAA, uh, Homeland Security, DOD, uh, and I said, hey, uh, you know, you guys talk about this. What are you going to do when the $1,000 Chinese drone shows up? And the room just roared with laughter. Roared. And I go, just keep laughing because it's probably going to be cheaper than the $1,000 UAV. And they actually uh, mocked me. And I've been mocked uh, a lot in this business. I've become a professional mock -y. Um, but, uh, you know, I said, okay, well, you guys all yuck it up now and laugh. And I was assured by... Um, people in government that the Chinese would never ever be able to produce anything as sophisticated as a drone. 
and that I was crazy and I should go sit down before I made a bigger fool out of myself. You know, whatever, here we are. Anyway, I, I kind of went down the rabbit hole a little bit on that, but good. All right, well, thank you all. Chris, you've got, to, you've got the next question. So this one will be for Joel Coulter and Mr. Perry. Drones have been, our drones have a broad range of dual use applications. In addition to the use of foreign drones opening new avenues for spying, what are your concerns about uh, bad foreign actors selling their drones in the US that have embedded components to take off, take control from? Yes, uh, I wanna go back to what uh, Patrick Egan said. I used to have all kinds of conferences for AUV, SIDC chapter, a lot of interest in uh, drone land, air, sea, by international, and at that time, we had resources in this country. Well, what happened is a lot of the rare earth minerals, a lot of subsidies, you know, people wanted to really have our market, and we just kind of opened it up completely to, to, exclude, to include the hacking of all military drone initiatives that other countries will put those military drone capabilities on a commercial drone, and I think we just had an announcement. We've seen governors using the free drones from DJI and the, the targeting aspect of those drones is military grade. So there's a really concern I have if we don't step in and start leading again, that countries around the world will have very advanced defense technologies applied to commercial drones. Yeah, I'd like to jump in real quick. I, I don't know if, because I work a lot in military defense over the years and up to now and in the commercial space, I don't think enough people really realize the quality of some of these DJI drones, yeah. what they can do capability-wise. It's eclipsing what American drones can do, military drones. Uh, or how about, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to single out FLIR, but I'm going to single out FLIR. You know, I've done some work in the military. I've worked for the Navy and the Army Space and Missile Defense Command, and I've used these uh, EOIR sensor balls, your your uh, Westcam MX-15s, your FLIR Sea Star Sapphires. Okay, so the new offering from DJI, and and they make bloody good drones. You can't. I mean, I, I people are like, oh, you're anti DJI. That's not true. They make good drones. Yeah. The, yeah. the policy team. Here in the United States, not so much. But the new system that they have that has uh, IR and has uh, EO uh, sensor on it and a laser rangefinder and everything else, you're talking about a 15 kilometer standoff. Okay. So if you had one of these EOIR sensors, you can basically look out 15 kilometers. But now for $20,000, you have uh, a system that gives you that same standoff distance. You know, you can lock onto targets, you can, you know, see targets, you can use the uh, IR, whatever else. You're getting, you're getting almost a million dollar capability for $20,000. And, and again, people were laughing at the Chinese, but I, I have to agree with Chris. I would say that most of the uh, American DOD vendor offerings are long in the tooth. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think uh, it has been that story for a long time. I remember the first headlines that I saw around uh, drone spying were actually from uh, the larger predator uh, uh, missions where they were tapping into the video feeds and sort of seeing what we saw. And I think uh, when a lot of the um, vulnerabilities and uh, security risks associated with some of these foreign drones in the commercial consumer space started coming to light a few years ago. There was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, industrial targets and their ability to view and assess infrastructure on a really large scale, wide scale. Uh, obviously, that capability, as you point out, Patrick, is, is continuing to grow. I mean, the capabilities of these very small, inexpensive systems are, are really astounding. Uh, I think what I would add to that conversation in terms of, of top concerns is actually much more exposure to operational risk. So if the proposition, and I think we would all agree to this, is in our defensive strategy anywhere from the, you know, uh, infantry to mechanized battalions to, you know, large scale operations uh, on law enforcement, we have currently the FAA running a pilot program in San Diego. 
uh, where we have law enforcement responding on the scene uh, to, um, you know, civil uh, law enforcement uh, actions. Um, you know, we're going to see a world where robotics, and especially drones, are part of how we respond operationally across the board. And the fact that we have technology now coming in from uh, foreign providers uh, that are a now critical part of our strategy for how we are responding to these kinds of real world events and the exposure that creates for them to not only understand those strategies, uh, but to have information uh, about, you know, where each platoon is that has an embedded drone with it uh, to, to know the response time for a, a tactical unit, whether that's civil or defense. Uh, these kinds of things uh, really do, uh, it, it opens a huge aperture, uh, not only into the direct vulnerability of, again, what the camera is seeing, which is sort of the old story, but of what we're capable of doing and, and providing that uh, intelligence to uh, adversarial actors writ large uh, seems to me to be very short-sighted. And just one more point, um, got an article this morning that the amount of money that China could put billions of dollars into autonomous drones, their approach to autonomy could be everything autonomous, every decision autonomous, whereas in our country, we always talk, I mean, we have for years about human in the loop. My concern is that with the, our investment is nowhere near China's in this area and that the whole world would be pushed into their view of how drones could be used without any human decision making at all. It's that, that yeah, is I, a arms race. Yeah. That's a concern. I also want to go back to the intelligence gathering really quick because there's these debates that people have. And if you haven't worked in, in you know, some sort of intelligence capacity, you have no idea what data um, is relevant. And, uh, you know, uh, some of that was discussed here, but, um, you, you know, so <laughs> everybody talks about how data is the new oil, but then when it comes to the Chinese drones, they're like, oh, pff, what would they, why would they want to spy? Why would they want to, why would they be interested in this data? Uh, you know, with saying that you're kind of invalidating the whole industry. There's so much data, even if they were just uh, thumbnail pictures of, of certain geo-reference locations, um, critical mineral mining, you know, uh, uh, different types of outputs of energy, whatever else. I mean, small things are uh, very telling. But anyway, that's, I just wanted to add that to people that keep discounting that. You don't understand what is valuable intelligence, obviously, when you say that. Right. Yeah, we, we got to move this along, but, you know, a big topic, a big buzzword, even in Intel circles right now is open source intelligence, OSINT. You know, that's stuff that is, everybody's looking into it, and this is stuff they can gather. This is open source that they're getting off of these toy drones that is free to them. You know, they're not having to work very hard at acquiring this data. And it's little things. You take one piece here of the data, you take one piece over there, you put it together, and you create something that is of intelligence value. And Chris is absolutely right here. And, and uh, when, when you really think about this, Bart, in the broader context of civil liberties, what Chris said is absolutely right. You're scraping data that is generally available through a geolocation, whether it be on your smartphone or whether it be augmented by what you're capturing from drones. And when you add all of this together, the richness of the data the fidelity gets you within a SEP, that's a circular error probability of where somebody is, even on a predictive basis. And so now you're tracking people. Now we're actually doing this in the scraping uh, through a number of awards for, uh, if you will, trying to map where people with COVID or who've been exposed to COVID uh, uh, persons might be, and we're doing this on a voluntary basis. You can sign up through Apple, or you can sign up uh, through the Samsung, uh, uh, Google uh, uh, platform that uh, just rolled out this week. That it's it's attempting to anonymize that data. It's impossible to anon to anonymize that data. Chris is one hundred percent. 
this open source data environment that we live in basically means that uh, really we do have Big Brother uh, operating here. We're in a, in a society where a great many people are anxious about how that data, once generated for purposes of protecting their health, will be used later in some other capacity and it will be injurious to their well being, health or otherwise. All right. Um, and it's, a, it's a big topic. We've got, uh, we have several other uh, questions that we need to address as well. The, um, one of them I'd like to ask, um, and this is for um, Mr. Perry and uh, for Mr. Stiles. Uh, what do you think the top two or three concerns about your businesses and the overall uh, U.S. drone industry uh, about the growing resilience on uh, or reliance on foreign drone components? Uh, is, uh, is that an issue right now? Yes. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, I think we're very concerned about uh, China's plans. Uh, I think uh, I think that uh, yeah, I would look to two of them. I'd say the Made in China 2025 plan that specifically made robotics a, a top 10 uh, target for uh, China's dominance uh, internationally in, in the trade. We've seen them pursue that uh, through uh, their you know, pricing strategy, which has been widely discussed uh, uh, in the government leadership. Uh, and then uh, it's backed up with these plans many haven't heard about china's thousand talents plan right and we've seen this recent uh, spate of news with robotics professors being uh, arrested for spying um, i think uh, our concern right now needs to be the fact that there is a targeted coordinated campaign to undermine the strength of the u.s industry uh, in robotics and especially drones and i think that our concern uh, as not, not only as a, a business uh, and our business interests, but also as a private citizen, uh, is that our, our country needs to have a, a coordinated and targeted response to that. Uh, I think that uh, I think when we have talk about the top two to three concerns we have, I'd, I'd say what we're hearing out of the administration and the Department of Defense and the Department of Interior sounds good, but but where is the actual plan to rectify the situation? So we have. Uh, it widely known that uh, it's, uh, you know, I think the presidential determination last year in June that uh, it was critical to national security that we have a U.S. industry base for um, drone technology. Uh, where has been the follow through on, on actionable items and spending and acquisitions to support that industry? I think uh, we hear a lot of talk right now and uh, about adversarial capital uh, as we're going through the fallout from the uh, the COVID uh, uh, crisis here, uh, the DoD is doubling down and saying, "Look, this uh, this trusted capital program that we started last year uh, for drones really needs to to be uh, to be successful." We've got companies that are going to have to turn to China. You know, I think all of those things we're hearing good words on, but I don't see a lot of of actionable plans coming out of them. Uh, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, China has been putting billions of dollars into acquiring even the leading U.S. companies, you know, uh, for, for this kind of technology. And uh, we, we need to have a, a way to fight back against this. And I think the most difficult part of that, when you look at um, uh, trade policy with uh, Section 301 tariffs or Defense Production Act uh, under Section 303, Title III activities, um, you know, all of those have, um, you know, provided the government with the tools uh, to, to put a plan together and to respond to the, the clear and open Chinese plan, uh, but, we, um, but we haven't seen those uh, enacted and actually followed through on and seen real results uh, in the U.S. industry. Well said. Chris? Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly, I think add none, but also kind of at a lower operator viewpoint on this uh, from the aspect of relying too heavily on Chinese or foreign components. You know, you have a lack of diversity if that, that happens, you know, in the U.S. marketplace. You know, if you're exclusively relying on just a small handful of manufacturers, rather it's component manufacturing or entire system, 
So that, that can lead to a problem like we see in COVID-19, where if you've got to block down a whole country and it's, it's harder to get parts, you know, and say your company, your operation, you know, you, you're dependent on having, you know, spare parts, you know, propellers, batteries or whatever that you need to keep operating for your clients and, and doing your thing or even your public, public agency. You know, if, if you can't get batteries, you're down. You can't, you can't keep flying doing flight operations to support the public if you're, all your batteries are waiting two, four weeks out, you know, to come from China. So there's that part. Um, also, you have to think about, a lot of people say, oh, the data, you know, DJI is, isn't collecting data. They can, you can turn that off in the app so that they're not collecting your data. Well, that's great. You know, you can, what we call air gapping. Um, you know, you can air gap your devices. I've been doing it for years, especially for clients that, you know, have higher, you know, data protection standards. But you know, when, when remote ID rolls around with the FAA and you've got to connect your device live to the internet while you're flying, well, that invalidates that because then anybody can reach back and get access to any of your data that you're putting on your, through the internet at that time. So you're, you're, you're opening yourself up to cyber attack as well. You know, if, if somebody could push a button from whatever country that manufactured this whole fleet of drones, and every single drone that's currently up in the air all around the world, or, you know, you could geolocate it, you know, a U.S. attack. Every single drone that's currently in the air, you know, falls out of the sky. And then the next time somebody turns theirs on, you know, program to fall out of the sky five minutes into the flight, that's going to create mass pandemonium. And, and, but and, you know, those are good. And I got to go one back. One, one, one other thing, you know, you talked about the geofencing and we talk about federal law enforcement, you know, um, and, and, you know, I didn't confirm this myself, but I, let's just say there was a federal law enforcement agency that tried to use their Chinese assets during an incident in Las Vegas, and they were geofenced out and their equipment wouldn't fly. And the idea that federal law enforcement that, you know, bought equipment with federal tax dollars has to call Becky in Shenzhen to unlock their assets, I, it, it's insane to me. Uh, that's one. The other thing is, is I think we need to take one step back and the notion that the Chinese are so influ influential in the rulemaking for the United States NAS is just beyond the pale, you know, as far as I'm concerned. When I say stuff like that, people are like, oh, you, you got the conspiracy hat on. And, and you know, but why, why would you let a class A adversary influence the rulemaking for the national airspace, which is going to in turn uh, have limitations on your aerospace ecosystem. It's, it's like, a, you know, a drinking poison or something. It's just uh, beyond the pale. Well, I think uh, culturally here in the US, we, we've grown to think not of China as a communist based political system and, and set up, you know, People forget about the Cold War. It didn't happen that long ago. You know, you had communism versus capitalism. There was a reason, you know, we, we had the Cold War and we've been at war with, with communism. Everybody tends to forget this with China because we've had such good trade relations over the last, you know, few decades with them and they haven't really been outwardly pushing their communist agenda so overtly, you know. So in America, so many people don't really realize, you know, as, as somebody, you know, very famously coined, you know, they're not going to eat our lunch. Well, they have been. And nobody's been paying attention. That, that, that's a great point. If I could uh, jump in here, I mean, I think we are talking a lot about um, the impact on the U.S. industry. And given all of the security threats and the overall arching conversation we're having here about how important this technology is, if, if we're resulting in a situation where the U.S. industry is not strong, I would say that is an attack on capitalism, right? So all of those uh, 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 approaches that I discussed earlier, whether it's tariffs or balanced trade policy uh, or uh, enforcing by American provisions or, or any, in any approach that you take to sort of have to level the playing field against foreign actors who are using state subsidies and, and state level strategies for influencing our market and, and not responding to that with an appropriate and aggressive approach to neutralize that impact, you, you are seeing capitalism defeated. And I think I, I would go back to this. The fact is, is that in the current environment, there are not profitable U.S. Uh, uh, companies in this 
in this drone space, especially in the commercial space. And, uh, you know, where our, our sort of greatest hope lies and where you see much of the government policy aligning is Silicon Valley, where the name of the game is we're going to, you know, run Uber or we work at massive business losses and have an, an, an unprofitable business approach and somehow expect to buy the market that way. Let me tell you something, the, the Chinese government not only is their checkbook a lot deeper than Silicon Valley's, but they're also writing a lot of the checks for Silicon Valley. So, you know, I don't think that that's a smart approach to, to addressing this. The Chinese and the Saudis. A lot of people are forget that as well. Oh, yeah, and as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. But, yeah, I mean, we uh, listen, if we're going to have a strategy for dealing with this and having technology that we can trust in a high security uh, risk environment, uh, we have to have a, a profitable uh, approach to this industry. Chris? We've kind of touched on this, uh, this next one for Patrick and, and you, Bart. What impacts has have aggressive foreign country drone initiatives in the U.S. affected U.S. drone businesses overall during the last several years? You guys want to... well, we, we did cover a little of that, but I think it was all relevant leading up to where we're at right now. Uh, the, the, the VC community has been infiltrated by the Chinese. Okay, so you got to be very careful on that. But uh, I was in China for uh, their World Drone Congress UAV show in 2018 in Shenzhen. 1,200 companies are making uh, parts, pieces, components, drones. 1,200. Okay, so there's a thing that they call Shenzhen speed. And, you know, these people build buildings in two weeks. You want to have something prototyped, you can go, I forget what they call the area of town, you go there, you talk to somebody that's a direct representative of the factory, and you go, I need X, Y, Z, um, I want, you know, this, that, and here's the artwork for the box. Great, half down, it'll be shipped uh, probably within two months, and you'll have it in Long Beach, and the beauty is going to be that it's going to be, uh, come in here uh, tax-free. There's no tariffs on it. So uh, that's changing, of course, but this, this is how they beat us at the game. The other thing that you have, and people won't talk about it in China, they know there's a problem. They kind of dance around the issue. But I wrote an article about this DJI bamboozling. Uh, did they bamboozle you? And, and these people have, they're, they're, there's at least $1.6 billion of investment in DJI. One of the investors is the new China Life Insurance Company. You look at the new China Life Insurance Company, 48% um, ownership by the PRC. You know, it is controlled by them. And these are sovereign funds. They go, oh, it's investing in technology. And no, sovereign funds. The 1.6 billion is, you know, what we know of. So, you know, some of these initiatives that we're talking about and, you know, I'm part of this, uh, I've been listening in on Agility Prime and all the rest of that stuff. Most of, the, most of the things that we're talking about here have already infiltrated that process. Most of the people that are there, um, I know we have the technological capability to do whatever we need to in this country, put a man on the moon 50 years ago. Can't integrate a 251 gram drone into the NAS, but, you know, we can put people on the moon and bring them back, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, you are not going to beat the Chinese with a $100,000 SBIR grant or contract, you know, out here in, in Northern California that you, maybe you'll get an office, a lease on an office and buy a little furniture or something with $100,000, but that's about it. You're not going to hire somebody. Um, you're going to need an accountant or CPA to keep you at 11 worth. It's just not enough money. So if you want to compete with DJI, um, you're going to, I would say, people ask me, what do you think we're going to You're going to need, the government's going to need to invest five, six, maybe even as much as $10 billion into um, an ecosystem where you can go and prototype this stuff, where you can have people buy, you know, making components, parts, and pieces or turn to them for these technologies and not just uh, toy grade stuff. I'm talking about, you know, uh, encrypted C2, uh, encrypted video. Well, you know, DJI's doing it now. That's another thing with their new system. They've got encrypted video and they have encrypted uh, C2. Um, so, we, you know, we're going to have to spend a lot of money to catch up with that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, uh, Chris and I and a few other of our uh, friends here uh, worked in a project with, uh, in a, uh, with NIST 
2018 to build a heavy payload drone. And we had some severe issues trying to find any American-made components to build this drone. And I don't think there were many, if any. I think the carbon fiber was about, was about the only thing that we could actually find here. Uh, it makes it uh, difficult, not only what you were saying, Patrick, I mean, it's, it's, uh, the prices are uh, astounding and the regulations are very high. Uh, China has, a, has an open door. Uh, they have lowered the prices uh, to where American companies are unable to compete. Uh, they do it uh, dimes on the dollar with what we have to do here. We can't even build an American-made drone hardly in the United States because China has dove so deep into our, uh, into our uh, UAV uh, industry. So how do, we, uh, how do we fix this? We have to be able to turn the boat around some way. And I think it's through a couple of different ways. Uh, there, has to be, uh, there has to be a group of people drive forward. Uh, American-made companies come together. I make copper, I make motors, I make ESCs. We get together and we start finding a way to put these together and grow them. And you have to have some regulations against what China, with them dumping this stuff into our economy, there has to be the ability to compete. Uh, we've, we've set the level uh, where it's just impossible at this point from my perspective. Well, these companies, some of them still exist. You know, some people may remember Astroflight. Astroflight produced uh, in the beginning motors for AeroVironment and some other companies. They're here in the United States, they're in Southern California. And I called like a month ago, talked to them down there. They're still in business and they're still making motors um, here in the United States and speed controllers and whatnot. But they're like, we don't do anything for drones, hobby, whatever, because you can't compete with a $3 motor. Okay, yeah. you'll never complete, compete with a $3 motor. So, you know, maybe some certification is, it needs to be, um, you know, put in place from the FAA. Um, the, I think we could come up with solutions. The one thing that, the other thing that we have to, to get away from, and I think where we're at now with the monopoly, monopoly danger is anybody now who is in the drone industry in the United States, not, and I don't want to like malign everyone, but most of the people who are at, like the, the chairperson of the DAC, I'm going to use him as an example. He has to be friendly to DJI. If you are not friendly to DJI in today's climate, you are marginalized. Mm -hmm. And then if you're marginalized, you can't play in the ecosystem anymore. So here's the guy, he's the chairperson of the DAC. And besides having questionable expertise, he has got to carry the water for DJI or their business model evaporates. So they have proxy control. They have proxy control of the world's largest advocacy group who carries the water for them. They have, you know, they're spending, uh, you know, money on the federal level lobbying and on the state level lobbying. So you're, you're this, you're, you know, we're basically, uh, you want to play in the ecosystem or the industry, you got to feed the dragon, man. And that's where we're at right now. So the regulatory side of this thing right now is the, the biggest threat that we have. Somebody needs to throw the brakes on and say the Chinese have got to get out. You have to have a firewall. I think we need a drone czar. I've, I've nominated a few people for this drone czar concept that knows the, the rules, the laws, the lay of the land, what's going on, what's capable, um, things like that. And people that not are not SMEs, that are app builders and the rest of this need to get out of the regulatory side of this. Or we are just headed down um, the road to a solid DJI monopoly. It's not even Chinese drones because you don't really see a lot of Chinese drones here. It's one company. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, they're not asking us uh, what does it take to get it fixed. I think there are plenty of ideas in the industry uh, about that and uh, not, not hearing those. Uh... Okay, well, you know, from my experience in federal regulation, people are not into solutions. Solutions work people out of jobs. So if you want to come up with solutions, and I know there are solutions. I've talked to people. I've come up with solutions. I mean, there's, it's not hard to come up with solutions to the problem. I see a situation where um, people are thinking about uh, private sector off-ramping opportunities. And I'm going to name names. makes me a popular guy. But if we want to look 
at uh, a point in case example, you have uh, Mr. Huerta left the FAA and he's on the, the board over there at Pair Zero, which, you know, the FAA tells people if you want to get a flyover people waiver, you go with Pair Zero. ASTM's in on the game. You got to buy their, you know, uh, standard, which no NOAA has been adopted. As far as I'm con concerned, that's a racket. Uh, the other, you know, part of that is you have 51 beyond visual line of sight waivers. Seven or eight of those are actual beyond visual line of sight. The rest are extended visual line of sight with a VO and somewhere in the neighborhood of 126 uh, over people waivers. You know, anybody think that this industry is going to sail or scale with numbers that low? Not happening. The only people that uh, can support a business model are uh, DJI. All right. Um, so we have um, drone speed used in a variety of ways, military, civilian, private national security, critical infrastructure, healthcare, logistics, et cetera. Um, what no foreign drone legislation would you all like to see? This is for uh, Mr. Goldberg and Mr. Coulter. Tom, would you like to go first? Uh, thank you, Bart. I think two things uh, are necessary in legislation. Uh, you have to carry forward with the FAA's uh, air testing stuff because that's a portal through which we can drive a lot of activities, so you need the funding for that. We have, and I'm going to use this by extension of example here, um, we have, uh, as, as part of the COVID funding, about $1.35 going into rare earths investment in the United States, another 300 and a quarter uh, million going into microelectronic support. And what we need to do is to aim those two programs at a use case such as drones, because at the end of the day, what we're talking about is making the electronics that go into those devices. So you uh, reach on that. So in the context of drivers, you get through the programs that the FAA is in fact promoting, and you push that very, very hard uh, so that you have the rules of the road for, uh, if you will, airspace use, which is really where the rub is at FAA right now. You already have exemption for farming. You already have a number of programs involving UPS that allow us to use some of the lessons learned there. And this gets to the very, very important part of this kind of legislation. USA Droneport is the place where the testing and certification of all systems to be used in the United States needs to go. We have no such place. The FAA has nowhere to turn in terms of data collection. They're using uh, the aerospace industry, whether it be uh, uh, Airbus or some other uh, uh, kinds of independent companies out of Germany to test their air taxis. Why shouldn't they have a place in the United States where we look at everything from the grommet all the way up through the operating system? And with regard to operating system, one of the things that we need to do is to keep in mind that civil liberties are important, as I said earlier. So as Richard Danzig, who now teaches it at NYU, who worked, I believe, in the Clinton administration as a Navy secretary or assistant secretary, he wrote a, a, a report that talked about our microelectronics coming from China saying we're living on a diet of poisoned fruit. And that's literally what we're talking about here. We're living on a diet of poisoned fruit and drones and everything making up the drone. Richard Danzig's very old report suggested that we make the microchips dumb. That is to say fit for purpose. So they could not do other things. Today, when we look at all of the stuff that Patrick and John have already spoken to in terms of capabilities, we're looking at a device that is essentially a supercomputer uh, a quadcopter and its functionalities need to be controlled. So you bring in the civil libertarian stuff, you bring in the, uh, if you will, the civil airspace stuff and you combine that around a need for a center where, the, where you actually do the development work necessary to produce the products that are safe for use in the United States and you literally outlaw anything else. We already have restrictions on use for DJI and we extend that just the way we are with Huawei. Just make them have a commodity jurisdiction determination if they can come on in and that means that the next Secretary of Commerce after Wilbur Ross has to simply say no thank you. And the reason is all of the capability of the subsystems that make up the total system. 
And so that's the way I would aim this. So when you're talking to the con Kentucky congressional delegation or the California congressional delegations, and, and, and frankly, John, I don't know where you're physically located, but any of the congressional delegations, you have to be able to talk to those three pillars. And I would put all of my emphasis in putting in a center and, and, and Bart, you created the center. We ought to be backing that center and bringing the resources to bear in the billions of dollars, not couples of tens of millions of dollars, to be able to create what we need because that's coming here anyway. You now have to be able to certify the safety, security, efficacy of those devices that will be flying over the heads of us uh, and not hopefully falling upon us uh, Higley Piggly. Thanks, Tom. Joel? Yes, uh, I would, uh, to extend what Tom just discussed, uh, we have now almost every federal agency has an OTA for 100 to $240 million ceiling. I would make mandate that every OTA, any money spent for rapid acquisition of drone components across the whole supply chain, network, hardware, software, and human has to be totally US produced. So you have to have a feeder, you have a, a trusted capital marketplace that can be designed around drones, but then you got to have a feeder into that and catalyst where you draw all these small, we have, we, have, we have the most innovative entrepreneurial country in the world, yet we're not providing the catalyst to them to draw them into a totally US produced capability, which we can do. And the other thing is once you do this, you this trusted workforce has to make sure that those that are working in the drone area are not feeding this back to China. Yeah, I, but you know, the thing is, is you, you know, the, a lot of that makes sense. But the, but the thing is, is, uh, you know, if you do not have a business model that can su support the type of um, production that we're talking about, uh, people aren't willing to invest in it or build in it. Uh, the regulatory framework that we have now with the FAA and what I just discussed, you know, oh, I remember, we, oh, well, we'll be able to get exemptions. The exemption process is arbitrary, I mean, the very definition of arbitrary and capricious. So there's not really a model yet for a, a industry that's going to scale. We have an industry that's based on the back of what I would call toy grade drones. And I think other people are starting to realize too that you can't do all of the jobs with a toy grade drone. There's other issues that uh, come into play with all of this. So the American aerospace needs a market for people that want to build these things. It's the same thing with the flying uh, UAM or whatever AAM, whatever you want to call this flying car thing. If realistically, if we look at that and we look at the examples of certification of say like Honda Jet or Cirrus Jet, and you're talking 10 years and, and a few billion dollars, you know, I mean, who, who's going to put in their money on that? Who's going to put their money into a drone company? I mean, if you want to give me a billion and a half dollars, I'll build you a drone. I'm going to build you a good drone. Well, it's, it's good software. It's going to be, you know, all the rest of that. But who's going to invest in that when we have a, a regulatory framework that doesn't allow this industry to scale? Well, uh, that's the question let I me have. come back to that. One of the things I told Daryl Headley, who is cyber policy advisor to OSD, is that if we allow the legal, so one of the things our country has is we have more lawyers than most countries combined, and we have most financial people than most countries combined, and we have to, the Chinese don't have this, so we've got to get out of our own way. There is plenty of money for this, and when, when the FAA did the UAS Center of Excellence, seven states won, but no one got any money, and then all the states can say, well, tell us how to draw. You can set up environments to draw the private sector, the oil and gas industry, the energy. There is a lot of private sector money and a new private public partnership has to be formed where the private sector wants to go into your range and do kind of things because they'll get advantage in the industry. And plus, if, if, you, if you don't have secure components, they're gonna be, they don't want their oil and gas systems hacked. Nope. So, I mean, I think it can be done, but we can't allow the lawyers and the financiers to run everything. Uh, let me interject and then I have to leave because I think Patrick made a good point here. I think that what I'm trying to suggest is you do have a couple open windows. The windows are 
pretty much uh, bollocks up, but they are still open. They're just hard to get through. They have a very, very thick screen. If we can break through the screen using the avenues of it, windows that are already open and, and push beyond where the FAA's uh, intransigence is, you've taken advantage of the, of the opportunity moment. And I'm just gonna use this very briefly. COVID has put in stark contrast vulnerability on supply chain. COVID has also put in stark contrast the fact that this economy, when it starts over, can't pick up where it left off. It has to leap beyond where it left off. If it's going to recapture the trillions of dollars in losses, the economy just sustained. This is a moment where that industry that Patrick and John in particular have been really engaged for the longest period of time needs to have a jumping off point. And I think this is the kind of argument that we make so that we're not mired in the problems of the past, notwithstanding the agony it's created people. But in order to get ahead, we have to leave all of those troubled areas behind. And we have to really get the Congress to focus on just the Chinese head, and Patrick said it earlier, you need your plan. Drones are gonna be part of your plan. Microelectronics, part of your plan. Rare earth minerals, part of your plan. Name your favorite. Uh, the independence on pharmaceutical precursor chemicals or PPE, name all of those vulnerabilities that have come to light. And we basically say, we'll rectify some of the problems we created for ourselves in the past, use our own enlightened self-interest to get beyond what Joel just suggested is this, and you're gonna to have to forgive me for this, but I've been waiting all day to say this, the mandarins who make up our bureaucracy, because that's literally where we are. We are, we are tied in knots by people who have no interest in moving forward. And, and Patrick put it correctly earlier that it is a job killer to be successful or to be, if you will, uh, uh, solution oriented. We have to change the, this mindset that Congress can do it with some very elegant, swift, uh, if you will, revisionist legislation that basically says we do not let the bureaucracy decide how to implement congressional intent we give the Congress the congressional intent in near regulatory construct. We used to do it with environmental regulations. We wouldn't let EPA write a rule. We'd tell EPA that this is your limit. You had to have an emission that was below this part per rather than tell EPA go fix the problem. We have to get back to Congress saying in explicit terms, we need this done. And as I said earlier, we have an opportunity the opportunity that's greatest is put money into the drone port as the vehicle to spend uh, on the problem set so that there cannot be any, uh, if you will, uh, uh, recalcitrance on the part of FAA or anyone else. We will now move into the live Q&A session with the presenters. We will keep it open to field questions past the top of the hour since the video is so long, but if you have to leave, just remember that you can still post your questions and come back later to rewatch the questions be addressed. Also, please visit our website at the posted link if you're interested in registering as a known entity or individual with your products or services, and if you'd like to work with us on moving the drone industry forward and be part of our database of partners.